Um, on behalf of uh, Cheryl Kaiser, myself, Eli Finkel, and the program committee, I'm delighted to uh, introduce this session on research integrity. Uh, one of the uh, things that we have um, sought to do in our role as, as certainly as program co-chairs is highlight some of um, the most exciting work happening in the field and also to pay very serious attention to the broad research integrity issues that the field has been confronting over the last several years. Um, I, I think one thing that we can take a lot of pride in is that relative to a lot of the sciences that are confronting similar issues, we, I think, have been more, we, social personality psych and really psychology more generally, arguably, arguably have been as proactive about confronting some of these issues as possible. And one of the goals that we have for today's session is to address some of the issues, offer some broad, comment, broad commentary on what the issues are, while simultaneously taking a, a sort of forward-looking approach, an approach that in principle suggests that 10 years from now, we have a science that is on a much stronger foundation, and we're focusing more and more of our attention back on the basic social and personality psychological issues rather than on methodology, presumably because we'll be in a stronger place. So I'd like to, um, without further ado, introduce uh, the speakers. I'm going to start with Yuri Simonson. Let me just say right here that the introductions I'm going to do for these speakers is nowhere near the introductions that this particular set of speakers deserves um, because I want to give them as much time as possible. Yuri uh, is an associate professor uh, at uh, Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania. I think it's fair to say that he, uh, especially with his work in collaboration with Leif Simon, uh, I'm sorry, Leif Nelson and Joe Simmons, has been a torchbearer at the vanguard of, of the really sophisticated, forward-looking thinking in terms of the research integrity area. So please join me in welcoming Yuri for the first of the four talks. Okay, so the, this, what do I say here? So the, the title of the talk is Go Big or Go Home. And it's, it's me, so you have to look at that screen, I guess, for this. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm Yuri, uh, and it's with, uh, with Joe Simmons and with uh, Leif Nelson. So to, for you to, to have a sense of what I'll be talking about, most of the talk today will be about me bashing power analysis. That'll be, that'll be most of the talk. And then I'll have some slides at the end talking about our, the proposed alternative we have, which is the way we're thinking about our own uh, thinking about how to set sample size, which is the go, go big or go home idea. I can, yes. All right, so uh, the motivation is the following for, for, this, for this talk. When, when, when you're p-hacking, when we're p-hacking, and we're, we're, we're dropping conditions or measures and monitoring our data, it is very easy to get our studies to work, whether we have large samples or small samples, whether we are studying a big effect or a small effect, the studies work. And so that means that we can ignore power analysis and things are going to be fine. Things are going to, be, to work. And that's probably why, even though methodologists have been screaming at us for 50 years, we've ignored them and we've been fine. They've been saying, worry about sample size. We said, we don't need to worry about sample size. And in fact, we don't need to worry about sample size if we be hacked. If we stop be hacking, in contrast, that's no longer the case. If we don't be hack and we just run one measure and we report that one measure, if we run a small sample, if the, if the effect's not real, it won't work. And if the effect is real, it will most of the time also not work. And so most of our studies will fail and we will not learn from our studies, so that, that's, not a good, that's not a good outcome. So that's, that's why we need to change how much we care about um, power. So as a reminder, when I, when I talk about power analysis, here's, here's what I'm referring to. You have to make a guess about how big is the effect that you're studying. And so you say, oh, I'm guessing this affects probably 0.5, a D of 0.5. So the means differ by half a standard deviation. All right, so I'm going to go to some software table and say, how many subjects do I need to have 80% chance of my study working if the effects, in fact, have half a standard deviation? That's your sample size. You run that sample size, and you've satisfied the methodologist if you do that. So we, we with Leif and Joe, started basically last SPSP after, after, after that presentation by, by Joe on, on, on big samples that I'll tell you a little bit about later, thinking how can we make power analysis easier? In particular, how can we make the guessing of D easier? And it's, because it's, it's hard. We don't have good intuitions for how big the effects are going to be in, in, in Cohen Ds. Like, is it going to be 0.3 standard deviations, 0.7? So we thought maybe if we, we think by analogy, so maybe if you ask researchers to think, is your effect going to be larger than this effect, but smaller than that effect? Then they can ballpark and have some table where you look up, what does your effect rank? Or maybe we can ask you to think about, 
in Likert scale points. So I think, oh, I think, I think my effect is going to be half a point in the Likert scale, and then we can sort of do the math in the, back, in the background so it's easier for people to figure it out. And we kept thinking about, is there a way to make this easier? And her answer was, no. We tried everything, and we, we, when, we, when we did the calculation, we figured out there's no way to make this work. Practi power analysis is not a practical way to care about power. And what I'll do most of today is share those, uh, that exercise with you to, to, to tell you why are we persuaded at this point that we shouldn't be doing power analysis. So if you have to guess D to do power, how could you possibly guess D? Okay, one possibility is a pilot. So I'm gonna say some good things about the pilot before I move on. Pilots are great for some things. Pilots are good to, to know if subjects understand your instructions. Pilots are good to know if you're working, your dependent variable is at ceiling, and so there's no way you're gonna get movement. You run, you run the pilot and that tells you, no, you have to change your stimuli so you, you're, you move away from the ceiling. It's good to know that everything's moving, uh, it's, it's working smoothly, right? The, the, the computer program is collecting the data, the array knows what doors to knock, what doors not to knock. Great, pilots are great for that, that's it. They're not good for power analysis, okay? They're useless for setting sample size. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through, through an example. So let's say the, the pilot is n equal 20 per cell. So when, I, when you see n is per sample, per, per condition, sorry. So two conditions, that's 40 subjects total. 20, if you look at psych science, our estimate is that the median sample size in psych science is 20 per cell. So this is a pilot that is so big that it would be the median study in psych science. That's a big pilot, okay? N equal 20. Let's say you estimate the effect to be 0.2 standard deviations. What does that look like as a confidence interval? That's a big confidence interval. It goes all the way almost to, to one, almost. Right, if it's a medium effect size or if it's a large effect size, what's striking about this figure, those, those three graphs look very similar and that's the entire range of possible effects that we talk about, small, medium, and large, okay? So if one way to think of that is say, well, there's a lot of sampling error in D. Let me try to say that in a way that's more interesting. So I'm gonna show you some numbers that make that graph from before be more intuitively compelling. Let's think you're studying something that if you, if you knew the true effect size, you would know that it, you need 75 subjects per cell, okay? To give you a sense, that would be an effect of like 0.45 or something like that. And you run a pilot of 20, okay? Let's see what the pilot is going to be guessing. Okay, we're guessing D, we don't know D. If we knew D, there's no point in running the study. We don't know it. What will the pilot guess? So how do we do this? We simulate data where the true effect is such that you would need 75 subjects to study it. We draw a, a simulated pilot and ask, what's the effect size in the pilot? What is the sample size that that effect size implies? So, okay, makes sense. Okay, the first pilot would say, you need 832 participants per cell. This is literally the first simulation I got. Okay, let's, let, let's look at the second simulation I got, 53. 96, 48, 196, 10, 311, okay? It's not useful. It's like tossing a, a, a very big die with many sides, right? It's not providing any information on how big your sample should be. Okay, it's not, it's not, pro it's not very, very useful. So you could object to, well, you're saying n equal 20 is a big sample. Maybe you disagree with that. Maybe well, all we need is just bigger pilots. So let's ask the following question. How many subjects do you need to know how many subjects you need, okay? So imagine you believe, you have a study, you have this sense, you probably need 25 per cell, but it's possible you need 50, you don't know. 25, maybe 50, so you wanna run a pilot to know do I need 25 or do I need 50? How many subjects does the pilot need so he can tell you whether you need 25 or 50? Okay, just think of that number, that, just make a guess in your head. You need 133. So to know whether 25 or 50, you need 133. That's more than twice as big as a big sample. It's completely pointless. Maybe I got lucky with that, with that example. Let's go with another example. You need 50 or 100. How many subjects do you need to know? Well, you think it's 50, maybe it's 100. Let's run a pilot. You need a pilot with 276, okay? In general, this is always the case. If you are thinking, I need N, but maybe I need 2N, you need at least 5N to test between those two. So pilots are not useful. Okay, that's out. Well, how else can we guess D? We could try to use published work, right? So if you're building on somebody else's work, you can look at that literature to figure it out. On the one hand, that's good. It's gonna be a larger sample typically, right? Maybe there's many studies. Maybe they run properly powered studies, right? On the other hand, there's publication bias. 
when somebody runs a study and they overestimate the effect, it's significant, they publish it, you see it. When it, they underestimate the effect, it's not significant, they don't publish it, you don't see it. So the effects you see are bigger than the effects that, that really are, so that's gonna be a problem. You will overestimate effect size. And then there'll be noise. They have a different population. You're in the East Coast, they're in Tokyo, right? They have a different design. They, they manipulate one thing, you're manipulating a different thing. They measure a Likert scale, you're doing how many dollars are you willing to pay for this. All those differences add noise, okay? Let's try to put ourselves in the best impossible case scenario where, um, would, would it be, so if we, we assume the best possible case scenario, would it be useful in that case? Okay, so I'm, I'm relying here on the many labs replication project by Klein et al, where 36 different labs studied the exact same um, pro experiments. They run the exact same experiments across 36 different labs. And so we can see how much variation across labs we see when everything's exactly constant. The same experiments in the same order, everything's the same, okay? Here's a chart you may have seen before. It shows the x-axis, how big the effect was estimated to be. It, they're, they're every study they run is there. So I'm gonna focus on one of them to do, to do some simulations. So the study by, by Schwartz et al. on how the scales you use to answer questions affect the answers you get. So the famous how much TV you watch per day example some people have an intervals of half an hour, the other one starts in two and a half hours, you've probably seen this before. If the intervals are greater, you answer a higher number, okay? So that, those are the studies, the 36, there you see 36 dots really close to each other, telling you what, what is the estimate for each of those studies. And that is noise, right? So suppose in, 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 real, in the real life, you won't see 36 attempts, you will see maybe five, so you are drawing from dot distribution. So suppose you draw from five studies, okay? Suppose five people have run exactly the same study you're about to run, and, they, and, and you look at the number, and it's gonna be on average 85. How confident are you of that? It's gonna tell you, well, it's actually 85, but it could be as little as 60, or as high as 164. So the best case scenario has a range of about three to one. There's no way you will be in a situation that's better than this, and it's a ratio of three to one. You don't have to run 60 or to run 164. Okay, in reality, it's, it's much worse. If you're running a study for the sixth time, you may be studying a moderator, and you don't know how much of the effect is moderated, or a mediator, you don't know how much the effect is mediated. Or you may be looking, well, I don't wanna know if people, how much TV they, they say they watch. We already know that happens. Do they buy more TVs when we change the scale? You're changing the dependent variable. All those things are just adding noise to this. Another approach you may take is, well, I just think the effect's about 0.4. Okay. That's, that's, I just, based on my theory or my gut, that's, that's what it feels. I don't need data, I just know what, how things work. So D of 0.44, that's kind of 0.4. And D of 0.35, that's kind of 0.4. If it's 0.44, you need 83. If it's 0.35, you need 130. So rounding error is 100 participants. You can go with pilots, you, go, you can't go with, um, you can go with pilots, you can go with existing findings, you can go with theory. This is, I think, the, the key slide that I'll show you today, so I'll, I'll try not to mess it up. What, what we became convinced, and, and, and perhaps you are convinced also, is that trying to guess D, it's, it's not practical. It's just not a good way to getting power. But on the other hand, we really need to do power. If we, if we, pee, if we don't p-hack anymore, our studies won't work if we don't do power, so what do we do? So we're trying to, we, we take a step back and say, what's, what's so bad about underpowering? What's the ultimate problem with doing that? And the problem is when the study fails, you don't know what it means. You don't know what to do with that. So you, you, you've sent all resources, you, you had an idea, you tested it, you run the money, you spend the money, you have a result, it didn't work, what do I do with that? And so if you put it that way, then it becomes simpler to know what to do. Let's power so that we do know what to do when studies fail. That's what we have to do. So that's gonna be the new approach. That's, that's a key distinction. Instead of trying to guess D, to be successful, we'll try to learn from our studies. So the existing view is, we want to be successful, we want the study to be, you could, you could say, well, I want it to be P less than 0.05, you could say I want a confidence interval with some precision, you could say I want a base factor, this doesn't need to be a p-value, it's just how much precision do I want? Our view is I want to learn from the result no matter what the result is. If you want success, then you have to guess D. Our view is you can't do that, it's, it's, it's unknowable. And think of it this way, if you're running a study, if that's interesting, it is possible the effect's zero. If it is possible that the effect's zero, it must be possible the effect's very small. 
Right? So what's the point of guessing D? The fact that you're running the study means I'll admit that some possibility effects very small. And so with the old view is you set N to have 80% chance of success, and I have 80% in quotation marks, because as I told you, we have no clue what that, 80 per, what that percentage is. And we want to set N the way we're thinking about it, the way we'll set, so that we are sure we'll learn, okay? So if it works, if the study works, we'll keep going, and if it fails, we go home. Okay, we learn from the failure that we sh this is not something we should be doing. What does that look like? How do you run a study with a big enough sample that if it fails, you decide to go home? There's many situations. We, we've thought of two main situations. One is when you have limited resources. Of course, everybody has limited, but it, they're salingly limited, okay? So it could be a lab study where you can get 150 a week or you have a budget or something like that. In that situation, you ask yourself, what, how many subjects am I willing to, to pay to, for this effect? Meaning, if, if somebody tell you this is how many subjects you need, would you run those many subjects? That's, that's your sample size. You run that sample size. If it fails, it could be that there is an effect that is smaller, but you're saying that's, it's too expensive. I'm not, I'm not willing to study that. It's like an anthropologist who says, I, 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 I want to go to New Zealand. That's where I want to go. And I say, oh, it's $70,000 a year. All right, I'll study people in New Jersey, right? <laughs> so you say, I, I'm really interested in this phenomenon, but it just, I just can't afford it. And if it works, you keep, you keep going. If you have an unlimited resources, what does that look like? It could be like Project Implicit or Facebook, where you, you get thousands and thousands of thousands of observations at very low cost. How, how, how can you think about go home in that situation? You say, what is the smallest effect that I find worth writing about? And you say, I don't know, D of 0.2. I, I guess I wouldn't be interested in D of less than 0.2, or a 1% increase in discrimination, whatever it is. And then you power your study for that level. And if it fails, you say, either it doesn't exist or it's so small, that I don't care about it, and so you quit. And then you guarantee to learn from your study. That's the approach, and that's the end of the talk.